Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Disputed Passage, starring Alan Ladd, Akeem Tamiroff, and Ann Richards. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Brian Ahern. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. One of the world's outstanding men of medicine, Sir William Osler, said at the peak of his career, nothing in life is more wonderful than fate. The one great moving force which we can neither weigh in the balance nor test in the crucible. Sir William was a man of fact and research, a tireless searcher after scientific truth. Yet he never ceased to admit the existence of forces greater than his scalpel could reveal. Tonight's Lux radio theater play disputes this passage, or rather puts it to the test in one of the screen's most moving stories. From Lloyd Douglas' great book, Disputed Passage. It comes to us from Paramount Studios, producers of the current Technicolor hit, Bring on the Girls. Among our stars tonight is Alan Ladd, a gentleman who got his acting start in radio and who has since gone places, not only in pictures, but on the stage of the Lux Radio Theatre. You heard him a year ago in Casablanca. Before that, he appeared for us in China and last spring in Coney Island. I think you'll agree that's covering a lot of ground. Alan is busy at Paramount now in a picture called Salty O'Rourke, in which he goes back to the type of role that made him famous, the gun-toting, swashbuckling man of action. Co-starred with Alan on our stage tonight is the versatile character actor, Akim Tamirov, playing his original screen role as Dr. Forster. Also a newcomer to this stage, but for many years Australia's top film favorite, Miss Anne Richards, as charming to look at as she is to listen to. Disputed Passage takes its title from lines by a favorite American poet, Walt Whitman, who argued that wisdom could best be acquired through challenge and dispute, instead of blind agreement or acceptance. I think that goes for little things as well as big. Certainly we would rather you put Lux Flakes to the test yourself than blindly accept whatever we may say about them. And I think it's because so many people have put Lux Flakes to the test that today they are serving in so many homes, lightening household chores and helping families to take better care of things they wear so they'll last longer and look better too. Well, now the clock points to curtain time and here's the first act of Disputed Passage, starring Alan Ladd as John Bevan... Akim Tamirov as Dr. Forster, and Anne Richards as Audrey. Some 15 years ago, at one of our larger medical colleges, a group of new young students, nervously excited, file into their first class in surgery. They know the significance of the moment. It marks more than the start of their careers... It is their introduction to the almost legendary figure who will rule their lives for the next four years. Their teacher, Dr. Max Forster. Well, where's Forster? What's the idea of keeping us waiting like this, anyway? Don't worry. You'll see so much of Forster, you'll hate the sight of him. Who says so? About every guy who's ever studied under him. He's a sarcastic, egotistical heel. And for your information, I'm ducking the eminent Dr. Forster every chance I get. Yeah, well, he's still the greatest surgeon in the world. Uh, he'd have to be four times as good to make up for what he puts you through. You'll find out, Bevan. You'll find out. Hey, pipe down. Here he comes. Sit down. Sit down. This is a classroom, not a ballpark. Well, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome so goodly a number of our acquaintance hour. For reasons known only to yourselves, you have elected to study the science of medicine. All right? But get this through your heads. You are no different than any other class of beginners in any other medical school. Your own opinions of the contrary. And remember, I will not tolerate indifference or incompetence. At least 60% of you will prove so completely stupid that you will be asked to leave for the protection of the general public. <laughs> Only in 10% of you by the time the diplomas are passed around, will there be a meager evidence of superiority? And it is to that 10% I now speak. From this small group will come the pure scientist in whose life there is room for nothing but science. Someone, someday, will tell us what we want to know about cancer. Someone will give us the cure for infantile paralysis. 
my eventual prediction, the men who are to achieve these feats are already born. Perhaps they are experienced scientists on the eve of their discoveries. It also may be that they are students in some medical school. These men may be here in this room. All right, now, as I call your names, you will rise. Ralph Anderson. Here, sir. Hmm. Well, well. <laughs> Gentlemen, Mr. Anderson obviously is a candidate for specialization in surgery. Thank you, sir. Yes, yes, since nature has seen fit to endow him with hands suitable only for stump pulling, he will no doubt elect to pursue a career requiring the greatest delicacy and skill. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. W. Bain. Yes, sir. I see that W. does not stand for William. My name is Winifred, Dr. Forster. Winifred, is it indeed? And so you have decided to overcome the handicap of your sex and go out to do a man's work. Well, very well. No doubt you see yourself as some ministering angel in white, restoring joy and health to those fortunate enough to feel your cool hands upon their fevered brows. I see no reason why I can't be a good doctor just because I'm a woman. Hmm, you don't? Well, perhaps you suffer from faulty vision, Miss Blaine. Sit down. <laughs> John Wesley Bevan. Kindly stand up. Stand up, John Wesley. Let the congregation see you. Yes, sir. The records here indicate that you came from a righteous little college engaged in the manufacture and disbursement of uh, preachers. That's right, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, you will be interested to know we have a standing reward here for any dissection that proves the existence of a soul. How much is the prize, sir? <laughs> I shall be glad to sign the check, Brother Bevan, and let you fill in the figures. Hmm. As a son of faith, you doubtless believe in the hereafter. Well, it's a theory, sir, that science hasn't yet disproved. You will understand one thing right now. Science concerns itself with facts, not metaphysics. You will find no interest here in a churchman's views on anatomy and pathology. I can quite understand that, sir. Any more than a scientist's viewpoint would be of any interest on religion. I trust, Brother Bevan, you will not be long in learning that rhetoric belongs in a pulpit, not the laboratory. I had always supposed that, sir, until now. Now, <laughs> quiet! If there's any more of this moronic laughter, I'll dismiss the class. All right, Mr. Bevan, that will do for now. Alexander Claxon. Alexander Claxon! Look out, don't let that door slam. Oh, for Pete's sake, Johnny, get your nose out of that microscope. Oh. Hi, Andy. Yeah, I've been looking all over for you. Well, I told you I'd be in the lab. In case you hadn't heard, Christmas vacation started today. Yeah. And you said you'd come home with me. Well, Andy, I, uh, I just can't... Oh, will you cut it out? Now, oh, come on, I'll help you pack. I can't leave. I've been waiting five days to find out how a piece of live tissue reacts to contact with a ethereum a dose of x-ray. You have? Uh, well, I'll show you how live tissue reacts when it comes in contact with roast turkey. Uh, I'll take a rain check on that. What are you trying to do? Please, Forster, you couldn't impress that egomaniac if you won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, but he's still the greatest surgeon in the world. Oh, how can you say that after the beating you've taken? Been writing you all term. <laughs> Go on, you'll miss your train. Okay, Johnny. Sorry. I hope you and Forster have a dandy time together. You can eat each other for Christmas dinner. So long. So long, Andy. Where's Johnny? Inside the microscope. Where are you going? Oh, stick around. You might find out what happens when a person blows up spontaneously. Forster, huh? You too. Well, well. Oh, I'm so mad. I Talk to the research man. I'm a social butterfly. So long. Hey, not going home? Home? Of course not. Dr. Forster doesn't believe in holidays. He just slapped four of my anatomy drawings back in my face. I've got to do them over. Well, what of it? They're not right. Look, Bub, I'm 23 years old. Maybe not good-looking, but not too bad. And I haven't had a date or put on an evening dress or even danced in four months. Nothing that I could remotely enjoy. And now, well, why couldn't he wait till after the holidays for his stupid old drawings? Hey, hey, wait a second. You don't have to cry about it. Oh, who's crying? 
Why, he couldn't make me cry. It's... Oh, it's, it's no use. That is a spare shoulder I could borrow. Oh, sure. Sure. Now, look, Winnie, it's just that... Your unselfish devotion to scientific labors, both of you, is most commendable. May I suggest that a bench in the park might offer better facilities for your present type of research? <laughs> get out of here. Okay. Okay, I'll get out. You bet your boots I'll get out. Hey, hey, what are you doing? You've got eyes, Brother Bevan. And so far as I'm concerned, Lincoln just signed that proclamation. This slave's going out and celebrate her freedom. Come on, let you and I get stiff. Winnie, I, uh... <laughs> I, uh... Oh, I can't go. Do I have to draw you a diagram? You and I are going on a party. Do me a favor. Find someone else, will you? You don't want to go? You don't know how I want to go. But these experiments cost money, and if I leave them now, I... You mean I this they... is more important to you than... Sister, in about 42 minutes, something's going to happen in that test tube that I've been waiting a good many days to see. I get it. Or do I? Well, one of us is going to miss an awful lot in life, Johnny. And I'll give anybody ten to one it won't be me. How about a date for next Christmas? Uh, swell. Oh. <laughs> do you realize there are three more Christmases before we get out of this reform school? Yeah, that's the trouble. There's not enough time. In four years, how can you learn You're what it's taken? you like he talks. Like Foster. Oh. Oh, am I? I didn't mean to. I'm just scared, Winnie. Scared that they'll hand me that diploma, I won't be ready to take it. It'll be here before we know it. Before we know it. To all second-year medical students, following midterm examinations, the students listed below have been placed on the honor roll. Alberto Fioretti, Chemistry. Watson Shelby, Materia Medica. John Wesley Bevan, Surgery and Medicine. Joseph Morgan. From Dr. Max Foster to all third-year medical students, from January 4th to 17th, all laboratory sessions will be in charge of John Wesley Bevan. Anyone failing to attend these sessions will be held accountable to the dean of the university. Well, how do you like that? Bevan. Well, why not? Well, why not? Because Forster hates Bevan, that's why not. Well, he's top man in the class. Forster had to choose him. Whether they hate each other or not, Bevan's no different now than Forster. He had a heart when he came here three years ago. It's gone now. Yeah, all work and no feelings. Foster's made a convert, all right. The pure scientist. Commencement exercises, College of Surgery and Medicine, will be held June 3rd on Hadley campus. Principal speaker, Dr. William Cunningham, Carlisle General Hospital, Shanghai. Gabriel Award for Best Scholastic Record, John Wesley Bevan. Valedictorian Thomas Lee. Gentlemen, 35 years ago, when doctors received their diplomas, they didn't have to know so much. Still, the job we've done hasn't been too bad. I think, for the most part, that's been due to a power greater than our own. You'll learn something of that power sooner or later. It has nothing to do with science. It has everything to do with humanity. In your years here, you've worshipped at one shrine, science. And that is as it should be. How do you feel, Dr. Anderson? Never felt better, Dr. Bevan. How do you feel? Fine, Doctor. Then pipe down. I want to hear Cunningham. Why? He's not a doctor. He's a missionary. And a pretty dull one at that. You cannot cure the ills of a body and leave a soul in torment. That is all 35 years of thought. And for what it's worth, I pass it on to you. Thank you, gentlemen, and good night. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Now there remains the awarding of one special award, Dr. Max Fort. I'm sure you will realize that the warm atmosphere of brotherly love engendered here by Dr. Cunningham has nothing to make. I'm asking John Wesley Bevan to hold forth in the laboratory for the coming year as my assistant. Do you accept the appointment, Dr. Bevan? Yes, sir. Like you, I recognize the ship is more important than the crew. Thank you, sir. Hey, Johnny. Oh, hello, Andy. Well, leaving for home today, huh? Yeah. What's your hurry? Uh, I got to see Forster. I wanted to say goodbye, John. All the best, Andy. Lots of luck. Thanks. 
Well, what about you? Oh, you know about me. I've started in already teaching summer classes. Yeah, um, that's, that's what I really wanted to talk to you about. Huh? Those kids, Johnny, they're squawking. They'll take it from Forster because he's Forster, but they won't take it from you. You're too rough on them. What do you want me to do? Hold their hands and tell them how wonderful they are? Nobody ever held mine or yours either. But look, Johnny, these kids aren't scientific experiments. They're human beings who've come here to study. All right, then let them study and stop their grousing. There isn't time for both. Okay. Well, I'll drop you a line, Johnny. I... What's that? It's in Forster's office. Come on, Andy. Sounds to me like somebody's getting murdered. Yes, I'm all right now. Where's Anderson? Taking your sparring partner to his car. He must have hit Carpenter harder than I meant to. All right, what happened? Carpenter? You know, Carpenter? Yeah, sure. You bounced him out of school last year, didn't you? Certainly, I threw him out. What good was he? A football player who broods a year about his failure and then comes back to beat me up. A man 30 years his senior. He didn't do a bad job, did he? Devon, I don't like this joke. Gonna press charges? No. Maybe I should, to protect society. If I kept Carpenter from being a doctor, that was one crime against society I was able to prevent. No. I want this thing kept quiet, Devon. Yes, it would never do to let on that the great Dr. Forster got his ears beaten off. What do you mean by that? You might give other students some ideas. Mm. You know, Zeta? A little. Want to throw up or lie down? No. I'll just sit down. Mm. Fortunately, you arrived when you did. He would have killed me. You had a good looking come to you for a long time. If you don't mind my saying so. Then why did you stop Carpenter? It so happens there are a lot of things you know that I don't. I've got to get them out of you. That's the most cold-blooded remark I've ever heard. Knowing how you despise sentimentality, I'm... Flattered. Yes, yes, of course. Fortunately, I now have a use for you also. There's a case coming here in, in tomorrow. Prepare job. Some patient of Brother Cunningham's come from China with him. What sort of a case? Well, some time ago, the patient suffered a bullet wound in the right arm. Penetrated the medial aspect with seemingly no impairment of function. Understand? Medial nerve? Yes. A few months ago, a pain developed. Not in the hand, but in the arm. An operation was performed, but no relief. What happened? Adhesions liberated without uniting the nerve? Probably. Anyway, another operation is necessary. The hand is now so sensitive that the pain is almost unendurable. Sounds as if the nerve fibers have grown up producing an aroma. Good. They went good. That's very good. You'll operate at 10 o'clock. Me? Why not? Afraid you cannot do it? No, I was only surprised you'd be willing to step aside. Oh, my fingers. Now look, when I fell. Oh, I see. Why didn't you say something? It doesn't matter. Just a sprain. But I cannot operate. Here, I'll tape it up. I have an x-ray. No, I said it was just a sprain. And as for Cunningham's patient, get it through that thick skull of yours that I'm interested in only one thing, good surgery. Who performs it doesn't matter. Now, tape up these fingers. The patient's inside, Dr. Griffin. Oh, thanks. Oh, good morning. I just wanted to tell you that, uh... Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon. I, I wasn't expecting to see a, a girl. Where is Dr. Forster? Dr. Cunningham told me he was to operate. Well, he hurt his fingers yesterday, and I'm afraid that he... Oh, I he... see. It is you who will operate? Uh, with your permission, of course. Dr. Forster didn't tell me that... Uh, I think that... Oh, look. Well, look well, what I... An you are in good hands, Miss Hilton. I have explained to Dr. Cunningham about my, uh, my automobile accident. Oh, I am sorry. Please do not think me difficult. It is quite all right. Then we'll proceed. Nurse? Yes, Dr. Forster. Call surgery. Dr. Bevan will operate at 10 o'clock. Supper will be here in a few minutes, Miss Hilton. Well, how's the arm? The hand, it is much better, but the arm, it is still very painful, Doctor. Oh, that's fine. I'm glad it pleases you. I'm myself not delighted. Won't you sit down? Thanks. I'm afraid I haven't time to visit. But the pain, you have not told me why. Well, your arm hurts simply because of the operation, but the hand is better because, well, because we've removed a tumor from the nerve. Oh, I, I see. 
The bullet almost severed the nerve. He must have suffered terribly. Yes. There are many Chinese suffering from wounds these days. Chinese? I am Chinese. Did you not know? Oh, but your name is Audrey Hilton. Your, your face... Uh, you're joking. No. On the contrary, Doctor. My name, my face, they do not matter. It is inside that a person is what he is. I was born in China, educated in China. I did not leave China until a few months ago. Yes, I am Chinese. But your parents? American. But I never really knew them. They were killed when I was so young. My foster parents were Chinese. They are the only family I've ever known. I, uh... Well, I hope I said nothing to offend you. Oh, no. Please do not think of it. I, uh... Well, you're doing fine, Miss Hilton. Another week like the past one, and you'll be playing tennis. <laughs> An American sport I have not yet acquired. Hey, there's nothing wrong with tennis. Oh, no. I already have succumbed to fishing. Dr. Cunningham taught me. I'll have you know I was once the best hook and worm fisherman in the whole state of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> How long has that been? Years ago. You know, when you talk like that, you are a different person. How do you mean? Well, for a little moment, you are not the stern Dr. Bevan. I think it will be a great relief to you when I can leave here. You regret even these few minutes that keep you from your work. This is my work. Part of it. Besides, I enjoy talking with you. Excuse me, Dr. Bevan. Yes? Dr. Forster just called. There's an emergency at Canterville General Hospital. He wants to know if you can leave tonight. Tonight? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell him I'll go. I'll see him in a few minutes. Yes, Doc. Canterville? That is not far from the Cunningham's place. You'll be staying with them when you leave here? Yes. Oh, I knew them many years in China. They're so kind to me. They have a wonderful place in the mountains on a the lake. There's good fishing there, Doctor. Yes, I guess there is. Well, excuse me, Miss Hilton. I'll see you when I get back from Centerville. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Centerville General Hospital, one moment, please. Centerville General Hospital. Dr. Spencer, hold the wire, please. Oh, Dr. Bevan. Yes? Dr. Foster's been calling you, sir. Shall I try to get him? Oh, please. Can I take it here in the lobby? Yes, Doctor. Hello, Bevan. Hello, Centerville General Hospital. I heard you were in Centerville. Dr. Cunningham. Leaving? Well, just about. Emergency here last night for Dr. Foster. Lucky I caught you. I can't tell you how grateful I am. That was a wonderful job you did on Audrey's arm. Oh, have you seen it? I was down there yesterday. No, I'm sorry I missed you. I stopped by here to see if you couldn't come up to the lake. It's only a few miles. Oh, thanks a lot. Bass are biting now. And I hear you rather fancy yourself a fisherman. Well, I, I sure do, but I've got to get right back. There are quite a few cases, and I've got my classes. Sorry, Doctor. I'm sorry, too. Audrey will be very disappointed. We hope to see you at the lake. Oh, Miss Hilton? Yes. Oh, but she's still in the hospital. Oh, no. Forster sent her home yesterday. That's why I went down there. Oh, he, uh, he did, huh? Yes. He seemed to think she might have left a few days ago. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, what do you use for bait up at the lake, Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> well, to tell you the truth... Dr. Yes? I have Dr. Forster on the phone. Yeah, and you can have him. Oh, uh, tell Dr. Forster you're very sorry, but I just left town. You left town? <laughs> yeah, and you can tell Dr. Forster that I've gone fishing. <laughs> Act two of Disputed Passage will continue in a moment. Now, here's Libby Collins. One of my friends said the other day, Libby, what makes a man fall in love with a woman and then stay in love? A lot of girls are asking that question these days. The answer isn't easy because love is made up of a lot of little things. But of one thing, I'm sure, one great compelling quality is daintiness. Think about that for a minute. Isn't it true that girls who know, you know, who are always dainty are usually the ones who have good times? Daintiness attracts a man and holds him. Daintiness is such an easy thing to acquire, too, and easy to keep. Lux Flakes do such a wonderful job of whisking away the day's perspiration from undies. Leave them sweet and fresh, so there's no danger then of offending. And Lux is so safe for your pretty things. It's mild and gentle, won't harm the nicest colors or fabric. Just as safe as water alone. Why, do you know a famous laboratory made actual color measurements? They found that undies washed the Lux way stayed color fresh three times longer. Those washed with a strong soap, too hot water, and handled roughly look drab and old very soon. You wouldn't think girls would abuse undies that way these days, would you? Well, if you want to keep your undies lovely longer, 
start lusting them tonight and do it every night. Then you'll know they'll always be fresh and dainty and keep their lovely new look longer. Now, Brian Ahern returns to the microphone. Act two of Disputed Passage, starring Alan Ladd as John, Akim Tamirov as Dr. Forster, and Anne Richards as Audrey. For almost a week, John Bevan has lost himself in another world, a lazy world of freedom and quiet beauty and good fishing. As he walks with Dr. Cunningham back to the lodge, the con... to the old doctor's other guest, Audrey Hilton. I still can't get over the job you did on her arm. Remarkable work, John. Oh, forget it. It was an interesting case. By the way, how did she get that bolt in her arm in the first place? She hasn't told you? No. Her home was in the interior of China when the Japs came through in 1935. Well, I guess Audrey was lucky at that. She's alive. She told you nothing of her background? You mean about China? Huh. She's no more Chinese than my Aunt Minnie. Well, Audrey thinks of herself as Chinese, and, well, that makes her Chinese. She's an American. Would she, uh, well, would she marry a Chinese? Well, you can't tell, but I don't think so. You've known her long? Since she was a child. Every year or so, I'd visit her home, her foster parents' home. At times, I think they loved Audrey even more than their own children. But they're all gone now, the old people and their children. Massacred. You can't blame her for wanting to return. She wants to help. Return? Yes. She didn't come to the States just for an operation. She's raising funds for China. Oh, uh, I see. Well, here we are. Let me have those fish of yours. My turn to clean them. <laughs> I've been away from this sort of thing so long, Audrey, it's hard for me to realize it exists beyond hardware store calendars. What exists? Oh, things like this. A lake in the moonlight. Great tall pine. Bass jumping. The works. John, that telegram this afternoon. I, uh, threw it away. What did Dr. Forster want? Me? Well, I'll leave Sunday night. You know, I haven't thanked you for getting Dr. Cunningham to ask me here. I was surprised. I did not think you would leave your hospital. You think I'm just a machine, don't you? <laughs> I think you may become one. There is a wall around me. It's because I deliberately built it. Did you or did Dr. Foster put it there? Well, he started it. The first day when I came to his class and later when I saw him work. And I thought I'd never seen anything so beautiful in my life. So you decided to be just like him? Oh, he, he talked to us. Told us what being a real scientist meant. That there could be no room in life for anything but work. I hated Forster as a person. In some ways, I still do, but what he stands for, that's... Well, that's different. Well, I swore that nothing would interfere ever with what he taught me to go after. That explains so much. <laughs> How do you know what I'm talking about? But I do know, because that's why we were drawn together. I, too, have a wall, but not of my own choosing. That is why we can be friends. Audrey. Yes? What you said just now about... About our being drawn together. Oh, I should not have said that. I'm glad you did. It means so much to me. I, I want to ask you something. You may ask me anything. I, uh, I want to kiss you. You wouldn't mind? No. Um, uh, my technique, it's, uh, pretty amateurish, isn't it? Uh. Oh. Audrey, what's wrong? Nothing. Of course there is. I act like a kid. Oh, you will soon forget. Yeah, but I don't want to forget. Oh, yet you will. You will forget because you are seeking to avoid life. I shall remember because I am lonely and seeking to enter into it. And you think that by accepting the unworthy friendship of a miserable doctor, you might feel less lonely? I am sure of it. Provided the honorable friend of Lin Yang would not find her a nuisance. Yeah? Who's Lin Yang? That is my Chinese name. But sometimes I get so hungry to hear the sound of it. Then Yang. Please. You will go back to your world and I to mine, but we shall be friends forever. Is it not so? I hope so, Audrey. What time is it? Time? Oh, it's, it's, it's a little after nine. Why? Because we must go back now. I am leaving tonight. What are you talking about? It is so. I am going to New York and to Washington. You know, every now and then I begin to think I understand you, and then up comes something like this. Why didn't you tell me you were leaving? 
please, don't be upset. I have my work to do also. In my little way, I do what I can for the Chinese people. Oh, I see. Let us walk back now. I'm sorry I'm late. I stopped in town to call Dr. Forster. Did we get off all right? Mm-hmm. I was going to bed. Thought I'd have a last pipe out here on the porch. Sit down. No, thanks. I'll be going back myself in the morning, Doctor. Not very flattering, my boy. The minute Audrey's gone, you leave. Well, I can't say that I won't miss her. Of course, dear, huh? Yes, I'm afraid I let him down running off here like I did. That's nonsense. You should have known Max when he was young, when I knew him. We lived together in Vienna. We had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Fun? Him? Yeah, he was the happy-go-luckiest fellow you ever met. Until she died. Elsa. Elsa? Yeah, they were engaged. He went completely to pieces when she died. Nothing but a bad appendix. The doctors didn't know then what they know today. The bad diagnosis. He's dead in two days. That's why Max came to America. Foster in love. You know, I didn't think it could be so human. You don't suppose people are born that way, do you? I never knew a man to shut himself off from life without a reason. It's again nature. But Max has never changed. No one, I'm afraid he never will. Never. Well, Brother Bevan, I hope you enjoyed your vacation. Did you catch any fish? Several, thanks. I'm surprised that a great humanitarian like Cunningham would indulge in such a cruel pastime as fishing. Or does he draw the line at the sole of a pickerel? I, I don't know, sir. We were fishing for bass. Now that you've had your little outing, you might get around to reporting on that case at Centerville. Successful? Yes, except the man will never walk again. That was to be expected. I spoke to the superintendent about finding him a job in the hospital. Why? Why? What business is it with yours? None. I just felt like doing it. You mean you talked it over with Cunningham and he impressed upon your mushy mind the notion that social uplift is more important than surgery? As a matter of fact, I did mention it to him. Yes, I thought so. Well, it may interest you to know that we are to have the benefit of his noble influence here, too. He's just been asked to lecture for the next term. Oh, that's fine. Now, if you don't mind, I have a class of new pupils waiting for me. Of course. Go ahead. Go ahead. Feed them on milk and water. Tell them what noble little knights they are. Yes, yes. Soften them up for Cunningham. Tell them all to be doers of good deeds and inferior doctors. You'll find my classes conducted as they should be. When they're not, you can always have me fired. Hello? Hello? You call to Washington is ready, sir. Oh, thanks. Hello? Audrey? John, what is it? There is something wrong? Oh, no, nothing except uh, that I want to see. I... I've been trying to reach you all week, Audrey. Dr. Cunningham says you're leaving for China. Yes, John, soon. I have been thinking that I must go. Well, uh, I've been thinking, too. Audrey and I... I... I have to talk to you. You cannot come to Washington? Well, the hospital's pretty full. I don't know when I... Well, uh... would you like me to come to you? I could stop off on my way back, if that would be agreeable. Well, nothing would be more agreeable. It will be several days yet. I will send you a telegram. That'll be wonderful, Audrey. I'll be waiting for you. I realize what an imposition this is, Abbott. Now, now, you feel it all uncomfortable. Please, Professor, it is a great honor for your humble student to cook and serve the dinner. Well, uh... What about the dinner? Is it going to be okay? Well, the dinner will be excellent if the professor's nose will permit him to eat it. Uh, pretty smart, aren't you, Abbott? Oh, someday, perhaps. Not now. Hey, uh, look, I've been meaning to ask you this for days. Where do Chinese like you get the name of Andrew Abbott? Oh, I, I observe the students in your classes are seated alphabetically, so which places the A's nearest the professor? The Chinese like to be close to the fountain of wisdom. Also, yeah. being close, the tendency is to be called on first for answers. I have observed that if the first person asks a question answers incorrectly, the professor is not as furious as when the third person fails. That is why I am Andrew Abbott, sir. Now, if I may retire to your kitchen, sir, I suggest you welcome the guests. <laughs> not have served a Chinese dinner, John. You see, now I am homesick. 
You liked it? Oh, it was perfect. But you did not tell me you had a Chinese cook. I've been talking with him. He has the accent of a cultured gentleman. He's one of my students. He volunteered to help me out. How is he called? Andrew Abbott. <laughs> but if he hadn't liked his cooking, I was going to change his name to Zabisco. <laughs> I fear I do not understand. Uh, just a private joke between Abbott and me. You uh, surprised me too, Audrey. Did I? That's the clothes you're wearing. This is how I dressed in China. And since you are the person with whom I am most comfortable, I wanted to dress in the clothes in which I am most myself. Thank you. Forgive me if I stare, but, but you're beautiful. You don't know what it means to me to have you here. I had two reasons for coming. I wanted to see you and where you live. It's, well, it's not very much, is it? Oh, very neat, very masculine. John, at dinner you started to tell me about Dr. Foster. Oh, oh, yes. Well, it wasn't until Dr. Cunningham told me about Foster, about what happened to him after his fiancée died, that I realized what a fool I'd been. There's really no conflict between science and life. It was Foster's bitterness that deceived me. He's just trying to alibi his own frustrations. Thanks to you, I... I see that now. I'm glad you feel more kindly toward the world. I'm not thinking of the world. I'm thinking of us. You have been thinking of others, too. Dr. Cunningham wrote me that what you did for that man in Centerville, the one who cannot walk. Oh, Audrey, don't you see here? This is all you're doing. Six months ago, I wouldn't have bothered my head about that man once the operation was finished. But you would if you had known. Yes, if I'd known you, been in love. No, no, do not say that. I must say. I tried hard not to fall in love with you, Audrey. I fought against it at the start, and then, and quite suddenly, I knew that that was my salvation. I love you. I want you here always. I, I want to marry you. That cannot be, and you must realize that. Our lives are so completely foreign, so different. Well, I can't matter if we love each other. No, no, please. I must have a chance to think. What is it to think about? Remember, I once told you I, too, had a wall that kept me from you. What is it? A promise. A solemn promise that is not yet fulfilled. What is it? If you could only tell me, maybe I could... No, I cannot tell you. It is my own problem, and I have to work it out myself. In China? I thought so when I came here tonight, but perhaps not. I, I think I shall return again to Washington. But how long will it... Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, please. Hello? Yes, this is Bevan. I say. Blood count? Why did you wait? All right, get him into surgery. Call Jackson, I'll be right over. Now, you see, dear, that's what your life would be. I've got to leave Audrey Hospital. Will you wait for me? No, but I should like to stay here until it is time to go. You'll go back to Washington? Yes. But one promise I will give you. If ever I do come back here, it will be to stay. Goodbye, darling. For a little while. For a little while, yes. I, too, hope so. The ambassador will see you now, Miss Hilton. Thank you. Come in, please. Oh, it is so good of you to see me, Your Excellency. I am happy to express my gratitude to the daughter of Sen Ling for her great accomplishment. Excellency, it has been successful? Yes. The money China so desperately needs is being loaned to us. Your work in New York is responsible. Sen Ling would have been very proud of his foster daughter. Oh, you make it very difficult for me to ask the question that has brought me here. I can help you? Yes, because it has to do with Sen Ling. It brings back the picture of how I last saw him after Shanghai had been destroyed. It took me three days to reach our home. In the doorway, I found Sen Ling and his family, what remained of, of them. As I stood there, I made a vow that so long as I had life, that life would be devoted to repaying the debt I owed to them. And now I come to ask you if my debt has been discharged. I must be sure that I have fulfilled my promise to him. Your debt is discharged many times, or your promise is fulfilled. I thank you. I knew what was in your mind when you were announced as Miss Hilton instead of Lan Ying. And that is as it should be. You realize at last that you are an American. Yes. For the very first time. And I hope he's a very nice young man. Oh, how, how did you know? What else could call you back to where you belong? <laughs> yes. He is a very nice young man. Hello, ma'am. 
Thanks. Hmm? Oh, come in, Cunningham, come in. Seen Bevan today? This morning. You know, that boy's very fond of you. Bevan? Bevan is fond of no one. He doesn't know what emotion is. And besides, I... Suppose you leave Bevan alone. We're getting along very well. Actually, you're very fond of him, too. Yes, promise. Great promise. If nothing happens to hold him back. Nothing will hold him back. That's what I wanted to make sure of. It'll be a bitter blow if you turned against him. What are you trying to say? He's going to be married. He what? He called me a little while ago. Wants us to have dinner with him tomorrow night. Audrey Hilton will be back from Washington. In the so morning. that's it. That's it. I knew he'd been seeing the girl, but I had no idea he'd be such a stupid now, short just a sight. minute. Now, I know. I know. I know. You think he's wonderful. Of course I do. Yes, of course you do. Know. What difference does it make if the world loses a potentially great scientist so long as he's happy? That one needs at least five more years of training. What makes you think he won't get it? For the wife? He'll be out grabbing for money. You're wrong, Max. He'll work harder than ever. A man doesn't always get a chance at real happiness. You of all people should know that. And you should know to mind your own business. Now, let me alone. Come in. Oh, it is good to see you, Dr. Foster. Uh, forgive me for coming to your hotel, but I wanted to see you... Alone. I thought John would be with you. When I called the station, he said... Yes, he was detained for a little while at the hospital. Miss Hilton, I came in hope that I may be frank with you. If you will grant me the same privilege, Doctor. Yes. Yes, agreed. I understand you plan to marry John Bevan. Yes. Mm -hmm. You realize, I suppose, that you are ruining a brilliant career, possibly one of the greatest. I know your theories, and so does John. We do not believe them. Oh, I wish you could trust me. I will not hurt him or his career. You have already hurt him. But that is not true. How could I? In the only way that it matters, his work. It has fallen off miserably since you first came There is here. no reason for that. There is every reason. No man can concentrate when his mind is beset with doubts, anxieties. Doubts? But what, what doubts has he now? I think, Miss Hilton. There is a man who chose a path for himself because he saw it would lead to a definite goal. Now, if you were in his position... And you abandoned that path. Wouldn't you be worried, fearful that you had done the wrong thing? Yes. That I can understand. I came here not to influence you, but to make certain things clear, which perhaps you have not understood. The decision must be yours. Mine and his. Yours only. He had made two promises. One to himself and the other to you. And he will break the first before he breaks the second, for he thinks then he hurts only himself. But uh, you and I, Miss Hilton, realizing what he could make of himself... If you himself, don't mind, Doctor, I think you have told me enough. You are an intelligent woman, Miss Hilton. I beg you to think it over. Good day. Get hold of yourself, John. Said she'd be here, and she will. Why did she check into that hotel and, and an hour later check out? Because she's probably coming here to your place. Oh, I should have met that train. The Forster gave me such a stack of work that I couldn't... That's probably Audrey now. John Bevan? Yes? Telegram. Oh, thanks. Bad news? We must follow our... our separate paths... You to your goal, and I to mine. Goodbye. It's, uh, it's signed, Lan Ying. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, our stars will return in Act Three of Disputed Passage. Now, I, I know all you ladies are used to pinching pennies, so here's a bright new penny. Suppose you tell me what you could do with it. Not much. 
Maybe get a picture postcard. Or the stamp to go on it. I could weigh myself on the drugstore scale. Or get a penny stick of chewing gum, if they had any. That's not much, is it? But you can do something really worthwhile with that penny. You can start getting rid of dishpan hands. For a penny? For less than a penny. How? By using Lux Flakes for dishes. It costs less than a penny a day to change dishpan hands to Lux hands. Just change from strong soaps to gentle Lux for dishes. Once you do, your hands begin to lose that red, rough dishpan look, sometimes as soon as the second day. Before long, your hands are soft and smooth and lovely again, and without using any creams or lotions. Tests proved it. I knew Lux was kind of hands, but I had no idea that it would cost so little to use it for dishes. Yes, Lux is really thrifty because it goes further. Ounce for ounce, Lux does up to twice as many dishes as any of ten other leading soaps tested. Lux is a really inexpensive way to save your hands. So spend that penny to start changing dishpan hands to Lux hands. You can do it for less than a penny a day. Now, Brian Ahern returns to the microphone. If you're as curious as I am to know a little more about tonight's stars, join us after the final curtain for a brief chat. And now, the third act of Disputed Passage, starring Alan Ladd as John, Kim Tamiroff as Dr. Forster, and Anne Richards as Audrey. <laughs> Three weeks have passed since Audrey Hilton's disappearance. Defeated and hurt, John Bevan has plunged into his work with even greater intensity than ever before. But his efforts show only an increasing mediocrity. And the first to notice it is Dr. Max Forster. You sent for me? Two hours ago. What in thunder's the matter with you, Bevan? All right, what is it you want? I want you to get hold of yourself. For all the use you are to me, you might as well be in Timbuktu. Moping around like a sick calf. I'm getting fed up. All right, tell me what you want, and I'll do it. It's what I'm here for, but I don't have to listen to you. Oh, you don't? Hearing straight, plain facts is a little too strong for you, is it? And I thought you had backbone. Well, I was wrong. No, but that's impossible. You couldn't make a mistake. I made one in you, and I admit it. The cold-blooded Dr. Bevan, a true scientist. Look at yourself, a sniveling pup, afraid to face life. By heaven, that girl had more stuff in her than you. Girl. What girl? What girl? Julie, really suppose you might as well have married her. Look at me. Did you talk to Audrey? Take your hands off me. Tell me while you got a chance. <laughs> Did you get her to go away? Yes. Yes, I talked to her. And she had more sense than you. She saw how stupid the whole thing was. You swine, you cold-blooded little hypocrite. Talk about backbone. You think you're fooling me? You'd have been married now if you'd had the chance, but she died, didn't she? They won. And just because you couldn't be happy, you don't want to see anyone else happy. That's why you sit on your little tin throne and try to play God. I did what was best for you. You were throwing away your life. That's a lie. With her, I'll be everything I ever wanted to be, including a better man than you. Because I'll know something you never know. I'll know what's inside of people besides blood and bones and nerves. I'll know the thing inside that really matters. Come back here. I'm not through with you. Well, that's too bad, Dr. Foster, because I'm through with you. I've been your stooge long enough. I've done your dirty work, taken your abuse, but now I'm free. And I'm clearing out. And where do you think you're going? To find her. Save yourself the trouble, Brother Bevan. The Hilton girl has gone back to China. All right, then I'll go to China. I don't want to sound discouraging, Doctor. But I'm afraid you'll be wasting your time. I came to China to find her, and I'm not giving up now. These are war times, Doctor. All means of communication with the interior are destroyed. If you do get there, Miss Hilton may be a thousand miles away. I traced her this far. Can you give me what papers I need? I'll get them. You know the risks? She went through, didn't she? Very well. I'd arrange for horses and guides. I'll leave here tomorrow morning. Quick! Behind these rocks, Doctor! Oh, sure, the enemy planes, Kai? We have no more planes here. If they see us, they machine gun. They didn't see us. They're going north. Toward Shentin. We stop Shentin, Doctor? Yeah, just long enough to feed the horses. Our troops keep ammunition near Shentin. It is good we do not stay there. That is where Japanese planes go. Perhaps when we get there, there will be no Shentin. No hoist, enough! Oh, back to your time! Oh, bombers came, Doctor. This was village we called Shentin. It's a slaughterhouse. 
Like a nightmare. Perhaps we do better not to stop. We've got to rest the horses. Tell your men. Wait, this place here, what is it? I do not know. Hey, I... Monsieur! Yes? You will pardon my amazement, monsieur, but I, I did not expect to see a white man. Oh, uh, can I get food for these horses? And for yourself, monsieur. The hospital here is at your disposal. Hospital? Where's the doctor? Well, uh, permit me, such as I am. Uh, my name is Lafayette. Your arm? Uh, the array. But I was fortunate, uh, only a fractured arm. Well, if you'd care for me to look at it, I'm also a doctor. Uh, a doctor? Oh, but this is God's mercy. Come in, monsieur. I beg you to come in. I have 40 wounded inside. And you, <clears throat> you attempt to handle all these patients yourself? Well, there's little choice. But I have two good nurses, Chinese. Uh, thank you for looking at the old woman. She'll be all right in a few days. Uh, monsieur, over here. The child, little girl. I'm sorry, Lafayette. I... I haven't time. I have to push on. Ah, yes, yes, of course. I understand. Well, I regret I cannot help you, but I've not heard of the girl you seek. Maybe if I came back this way, I can, I can stay longer. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, what's the use? A few minutes more won't matter. Show me the child. Oh, please. this one, monsieur. Her leg. We have not had time, and this, this arm of mine... Here, let me see. Broken. Yes, monsieur. In four places, as best I can tell. I, I have no more x-ray. Tell my guides to unsaddle the horses. I'll stay. Where's Ether, doctor? Hurry, will you? That boy was hemorrhaging. You can take off your gown, doctor. What do you mean? The boy died an hour ago. Oh. Come inside. You must lie down. You have not come here. Poor help. I don't make them mistakes. What to do? No, were you sure that what words could? Uh, monsieur, I am much interested in your technique. In all my experience, I have seen but one other man who uses instruments as you do. Oh? Yes. At the Sorbonne in Paris, I once studied there. The great Forster. A few weeks ago, I was the assistant of the great Forster. Monsieur, you are joking. No. Nobody jokes about Forster. Listen. Planes. Yes, doctor. Planes and bombs. They wouldn't bomb here again. I'm afraid they will. They are trying to destroy an ammunition dump. They missed it yesterday. We've got to remove our patients, doctor. There is a bomb shelter in the rear. Hurry, please. <laughs> This is Dr. Forster. What is it? Cablegram for you, Doctor. Cablegram? From China, Guangxi Province. Read it. Read it. John Bevan, wounded air raid. Shrapnel embedded in brain. Holds no hope. It is signed Basil Leferrier, Mission Hospital, Shenzhen. Thank you. Thank you. Nurse. Nurse. Yes, Doctor. Find out where Shenzhen is in China in the quickest way I can get there. I must get immediate reservations. Don't stand there. Hurry. You got here at all, Dr. Forster. But you cannot expect to do the impossible, even under the best conditions. There one is dying, but he's still alive. We must do what must be done. Operate here? Of course. Well, there's a Chinese doctor with him now, Dr. Chong. He can help you more than I, my, uh, my arm. Oh, yes, yes, but you'll stand by. I may need you for a transfusion. Now get your surgery ready. Um, Lafayette. Yes? The girl, Miss Hilton, did Bevan ever find her? No. In his delirium, before the coma, he asked for her so many times. Uh, we are trying to locate her. You know where she is? Mm, a little rumors. A village a hundred miles up the river. There is talk of a white girl who drives an ambulance. A white girl with a Chinese name. Send for her. We have already. Perhaps she is the one he's... Now, we're waiting. We're wasting time. Start an aesthetic. I'll be right in. Well, speak to me, doctor. Respiration 12. Lover, yeah? Yes. Now, look. The course of the shrapnel, it was penetrated the front or low. We shall find it about a fissure over London. There is nothing we can do. Nothing? We can remove the pressure. Ah. The, the patients inside, uh, they are praying for him. Let them pray. It will take their minds off of themselves. Light. Now, uh, where's more light? If you were Bevan, doctor, would you want prayers or my skill? I, 
I would rather not answer that. We're retractors. 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 Hurry, Doctor. You must hurry. Stop your stupid talk. My forehead. My forehead. Wipe my forehead. The pulse becomes weaker, Doctor. Transfusion. The fire. We are prepared. Fighty. Fighty. The bon bois. 30 minutes more. Perhaps less. Less? Yes. He may die. Pulse? Respiration? The pulse is stronger, Doctor. Respiration 18. Sponges, nurse. Now bandages. The operation is finished. We should have started two rally hours ago. The pressure was lifted. There is still hope, Doctor. He holds his own. I tell you, I cannot understand it. You must not harass yourself. You operated under tremendous difficulties. In your own surgery with proper... No, 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 no. That's got nothing to do with it. The operation itself could not have been more successful no matter where it was performed. Whatever, whatever these two hands can do, they have done. But here he lies and... Oh, I'm helpless. Yes. All that science can do has been done. Nothing can help Dr. Bevan now except himself. Oh, himself, himself. And what does, what does that mean? What can Bevan do? He's never come out of the coma. There comes a time when we are all helpless women of medicine, when nothing can help except something inside the patient, the, the will to live. If there was some way to strike a, a spark Save within... your breath, please. I have no time to listen to talk of mystic powers. Oh, no, 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 no. I speak of nothing strange, monsieur. I, I speak only of his soul. Doctor, do you hear the flames again? Flames? You can't move him. Get the mattresses quick. Furniture, anything. Anything that might protect him. Wait, wait. He comes from the west. The Japanese never come from the west. Chong, look. It is a Chinese plane. It is landing. A woman gets out. A woman. What woman? He's coming to us, gentlemen. It is, it is Audrey Hilton. <laughs> Then I'm sure he knew me. Perhaps, Miss Hilton, perhaps. I hope so. Oh, he's so white. He lies there as if he was. John. John, I am here. I am here to stay. Please don't leave me now. Please. Miss Hilton, Can't you hear me, darling? Please come back. It is only a little way. His eyes. He's opening his eyes. John. And they close again. Still the coma. Yes. Miss Hilton, there's nothing you can do. You should get some rest. I will stay. He may wake me. He may wake me. How's he? He has not moved. What's this? this? What's this? This is a blanket. The John was cold. She put it about you. Audrey? You. Audrey. Audrey. Look, he was his doctor. Stand aside. Audrey. Audrey, don't go. No, my dear. I will stay always. God. God in his infinite mercy. Don't, don't try to talk. Uh, I... What? What? Oh, no, 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 it's too soon, not yet. I'm tired. So tired. What? I sleep. Sleep, my darling. The sun will be here when you wake. The sun and I. The sun and you. Doctor. All I could do, I did. It was not enough. What are you saying? Look at him. The shock was too much for any human. But he's breathing. It is regular. Sometimes I think that perhaps... Lafayette, he's sleeping. Look, his face, the color, it turns. He will recover. Thank God. Oh, thank God. Audrey. Come here, Audrey. You saved his life. No, not I. No science. No, it was something... Something beyond us. Audrey, I don't know if you can forgive me, either of you. But what I did to you both, I thought it was for the best. I wanted him to be as great 
As great as I knew he could be, please try to believe me. I believe. I thought I had given him the greatest strength any man could know, science. But I have seen something, something even greater. Surely there is a God in the heavens, for I have seen... Yes, I have seen his miracle. Stars will be back for a curtain call in just a moment. Now, here's Sally. With a history lesson. History, Sally? Mm-hmm, stocking history. Did you know that men wore the first really modern stockings? No, when was that? Oh, back in the 1500s. And just guess who started it? King Henry VIII. They were hand-knitted for him in Spain. Well, what did people wear before that? Oh, stockings made of wool or velvet cloth, cut to the shape of the foot and leg and then seamed up the back. For years, Henry was the only person who had knit one. I wonder if he ever got run. <laughs> oh, probably. After all, that was about four centuries before Lux Flakes were invented. No wonder new stockings were a luxury. But now any woman can have better, surer stockings than King Henry did. And thanks to Lux, can keep them lovely a long time. Gentle Lux Care saves elasticity, so stockings give under strain instead of popping them to run so easily. They fit better, too. Don't risk cake soap rubbing or strong soap. Strain tests show these things make runs come much sooner. Stockings washed with mild Lux Flakes last twice as long. And that's just like getting an extra pair of stockings every time you buy a pair. Lux Care is thrifty. Now, back to Brian Ahern and our stars. I'm sure we're all grateful to Alan Ladd, Hakim Tamirov, and Ann Richards for their excellent presentation of tonight's play. And I must confess that after so many appearances on Lux myself, it was sort of fun for me to sit on the sidelines for a change and watch. Well, you deserve it, Brian. After your long trek overseas, we've heard a lot about your good work at the battlefront. <laughs> well, entertaining those boys is really a privilege. But it's nice to be home again and to welcome a new star to our stage in such a pleasant form as Miss Ann Richards. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. She gave me a charming leading lady, Brian. I, I can readily see why she's Australia's favorite screen star. I think she'll be one of America's favorite screen stars, too, when you see her in the picture she's just finished for Hal Wallace. Yes, in love letters, and his letter perfect. Well, what have you been doing at Paramount, Hakim? Me? Oh, I was watching Alan Ladd. <laughs> watching Alan? What, with Ann Richards on the lot? Well, she's been watching Alan, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, what's the matter? Afraid he'd walk off with the props? No, no, but uh, you see, we're both interested in horses. Oh. Oh. Uh, oh, I see, and Alan sort of uh, reminds you of... <laughs> well, I uh, think a kid is talking about the picture I was making, Brian, at it has a lot to do with horses and, and horse racing. <laughs> yes. With all the tracks closed, Paramount is the only place where you can spend a day at the races. <laughs> well, if you're interested in riding, Anne, you should see Akim as Pablo in For Whom the Bell Tolls. I saw him. <laughs> and does he ride a horse? Yes, I never thought anything filled with hay could be so hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you stayed on all right, Akim. Yes, yeah, sure. I got my pants caught in the saddle. <laughs> well, while you're caught in the saddle, Akim, let me remind you of our show for next week, which also has to do with saddles. It's the brand new RKO screen thriller, Tall in the Saddle, starring John Wayne and Ella Raines in their original screen roles. Together they bring you an action-packed adventure story woven around a mysterious murder and complicated by two women fighting for a man's love. It's a story of suspense and drama in the best Western style. Sounds like great entertainment, Brian. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night and I hope we meet again. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in wishing you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Tall in the Saddle with John Wayne and Ella Raines. <laughs> One of the timeliest jobs that you can do for America at war is also one of the easiest. It's saving those waste fats and greases from your kitchen. Little as they mean to you, they're vitally important in the manufacture of essential war materials. Which is why your butcher is prepared to give you two red ration points plus four cents for each pound. Strain waste kitchen fats into a clean can, rush them to your butcher. 
Heard in tonight's play were Trude Marson, Norman Field, Jay Novello, Cleet Lee, Ralph Lewis, Eddie Marr, Robert Regent, Charles Seal, Lal Chandmera, Leon Ledoux, Barbara Jean Wong, and Paul Theodore. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John N. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Tall in the Saddle with John Wayne and Ella Raines.